So Joshua chapter 11, this battle of Hazor, uh, we'll just read the very first verse. It says, Then Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, and he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and the king of Shimron, and goes through all these different things. And they go out and they fight against Israel, right? And Israel wins. And the Bible says that they burned Hazor to the ground. It says all the other cities in that region they kept, but Hazor they burned, utterly destroyed it, right? So Hazor was one of the cities that they kind of devoted to the ban, is what they called it, of utter destruction, burned it to the ground, right? So it says Jabin, uh, the king of that area, of the Canaanites, of, in Hazor, fought against Joshua. Joshua killed Jabin and burned Hazor to the ground, right? So then now let's go back to Joshua, or Judges chapter 4, with that in mind. So Judges 4, verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Hashereth Hagoim. Uh, and so that is the enemy that Deborah is raised up to defeat, right? And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we reconcile this? That in Joshua 11, it says that Jabin, who lived in Hazor, was killed by Joshua, and uh, Hazor burned to the ground. Then later, what we believe to be later, it seems to be much later, is Deborah, right? And, and there's no mention of Joshua, although Jeff, Deborah is also from Ephraim. And, and she says she's judging, so it has to be, you would think, later than Joshua. Uh, because this is after Ehud, and after all these things where Israel has done evil. And Deborah, it says, is the one now that's, that's in charge of Ephraim. Which if Joshua was still around, Deborah wouldn't have been in charge of Ephraim. Uh, because that was Joshua's territory. So this must be much later. And so how do we understand it? I think the first thing is that what it must be is that Jabin is a title not a name, like Pharaoh, Abimelech was the Philistine name, right? Um, so it must be that Jabin was just the name of how they would call their king. So just like, you know, Pharaoh would fight and then, you know, a hundred years later they're still fighting Pharaoh. It's not the same person, that's just what they called their king. Um, and so that's a probable thing. Um, and then you would have to ask, well, how did they get back into Hazor, right? Um, and I would think that, uh, that the Israelites didn't dwell in Hazor because they had banned it, right? They, they burned it, left it alone. But if that was the capital city of the entire northern area up there, it's got to be strategically positioned well. And so if the enemy was going to go back to anywhere to start trying to rebuild, it would probably be in that same area because there was a reason they chose it in the first place. You know, proximity to water, high position, because it, you know, it must have been on some kind of mountaintop. Um, and so what it appears is that through these 100, 120 years or so, however long this was, after the time of Joshua, when we get to Deborah, that these Canaanites have gone back to Hazor, and they have rebuilt in that general area, and they have become strong again because the Israelites in that area did not maintain, um, you know, because all through this time we're seeing how the Israelites are just holding on, right? Because they're not really serving the Lord like they should, so God's giving them over to the hand of the enemy, and they're just barely holding on. So they're not in any position um, during the time of the judges to really be taking new territory most of the time. Most of the time they've fallen into idolatry, God's given them into the hand of their enemy, and they're uh, abused for 10 to 20 years, and then God raises up a judge, they defeat that enemy, and then they have peace, but their army doesn't get any stronger, really, and start taking in an, in an offensive, aggressive way. They just kind of get back what they had, right? And so, um, so it's possible that during this time, while Israel is not all that strong, that the Canaanites just went back in and reestablished where they had been, which was Hazor. Um, and so that, I believe, is probably the best way to explain how you get another Jabin from Hazor in Judges 4 and when they had a Jabin from Hazor in Joshua 11. Um, 
that it doesn't appear to be the same story, because uh, that would be a little weird that Deborah and Joshua were contemporaries. I don't think that could be the case, because it says at that time Deborah was judging Israel, uh, judging Ephraim, um, judging Israel from Ephraim, and so it doesn't fit with with Joshua still being alive. Um, and so what she does, just to give a basic breakdown, and then we'll, we'll close. And we'll, we'll go into this in more detail next week because I have a, a good map for you. So if this is Ephraim, or not Ephraim, Israel. They look the same sometimes. Um, that up in here we talked about this was Naphtali, right? Um, and then down here is kind of Ephraim in this general area. Deborah is judging at this point. And God says to her, I want you to go north into Kadesh, which is up here. And I want you to find Barak, right? And tell him to lead my people, right? So, um, and she gets up there. She tells Barak, hey, you've got this promise. You can, you can win. Because Hazor then is, is in between the two. Hazor is right here, right? And so this is where the enemy is. And so she sends up and says, hey, God's promised that he'll allow you to defeat Hazor in this Jabin. Um, and he says, well, if you come with me, I'll come down here because Mount Tabor is right here. And so God tells her to go up there and get him to take 10,000 people and to go align on Mount Tabor, right? And so when she gets up there, he says, well, I want you to come with me. Um, and so, you know, Barak is not leading the way that he should. Just leave that alone. And so Deborah has to fill in for his weakness of leadership. And so they come down to Mount Tabor. That was not typical What? It, it, it's, it's genetic. It has to do with the name. <laughs> oh, oh, you're talking... Uh, <laughs> yeah, which is why she, she told Brock, are you sure you want me to come? Because if I come, I'm going to get the credit for this, you know, because I'm the leader here. So it wasn't this... But the other thing is she was leading... Israel at the time. She, the Bible says she was judging Israel. Um, and so I think sometimes our image of women being totally subservient in that culture is what everybody talks about, but it's not always the case. Um, there's some major cities in, in Ephraim um, that it, it talks about a woman built them. Um, I think her name was Shira. Um, and she was, she was related to, that, to the Hezron, I think. Um, that had gone up, no, not Hezron. Um, but anyway, she was, she must have been related to Joshua somehow out of his tree. Um, so it was one of Joshua's relatives. Um, and because he was from Ephraim, obviously. But I, I forget exactly who it was, but her name was Shira. She, she must have been the great granddaughter of Ephraim. And she, the Bible says, built three of those major cities in Ephraim. Um, and so, so how that works, I don't know. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know that, um, I mean, obviously they weren't normally militarily uh, there, but apparently Deborah had the spirit of the Lord. She was a prophetess. Um, and so, yeah, so that definitely wasn't typical for a woman to lead. So I don't know how that came about. But at the same time, we do see several instances of women kind of taking the reins. Um, you know, Caleb's daughter comes to him and asks for a, a better inheritance. Something with water. She says, listen, if you're going to stick me in the desert, at least give me water while I'm out here. And so he gives her, you know, the springs that were in that part of the world. Um, and so, uh, so she comes up, gets him to come down. And then Jabin realizes what's happening and comes and positions himself right here. Um, and this is where the battle takes place out in the field, which is the Jezreel Valley is where this major battle takes place, uh, and Deborah wins in the Jezreel Valley. Anybody know what the Jezreel Valley is famous for? And it has to do with the battle. Well, David was down here. It is a famous battle, though. David would have been uh, down here in this region. This is north, just outside of the Sea of Galilee, where the Jezreel Valley is. It's actually right near Nazareth. Um, and then the other valley that's in Nazareth is 
place called Megiddo. And the hill that's there is Armageddon, or Armageddon, however you pronounce it. And so, but that's what that means, the hill in Megiddo. And so, this valley of the Jezreel is where they fought, typically, many of the battles took, took place there because it was a flat valley. It was easy to fight there. Um, and so, that was the valley, and Nazareth is the hill. Right, so when Jesus grew up in Nazareth, it was on the outskirts of this same valley, right? Which is also interesting then, as you've heard me say in other classes, then that means that Armageddon is the valley right where Jesus grew up. Um, and so they fought several battles there, but th that is the Jezreel Valley. Um, and then on the other side of the Jezreel Valley is Mount Carmel, um, which is where Elijah called down the fire from heaven, it was on the other side of this valley. And there is a river that goes right through it called the Kishon River. And so this battle takes place on the edge of the Kishon. Um, and the Kishon is also where the prophet of Baal came down uh, when Elijah had them killed. So this, this all takes place. So it's just kind of interesting that this giant battle takes place um, in that valley. All right, so let's pray. And then when we come back next week, uh, we'll really go into... Deborah and Gideon. We'll do both of those um, next week. Okay.